Public Library. We're excited to partner with the Montana State Auditor's Office and have a rock star here. And <laughs> Today, it's my pleasure to introduce Commissioner of Securities and Insurance State Auditor Monica J. Lindeen. Commissioner Lindeen was elected in 2008 and re-elected to a second term in 2012. She has made it her mission to protect Montana's security and insurance consumers through education, fairness, and transparency. During Commissioner Lundin's tenure, her office has returned more than $374 million to investors and insurance commissioners. Monica, thank you for hosting tonight. Thank you. Well, good evening. Uh, thank you, Beth, for that very nice introduction. Thank you for hosting us. We really appreciate being able to use this room here in Bozeman at the Public Library. And also, um, the young woman who started this off tonight, she forgot to introduce herself. Um, her name is Emily Sam Hammer, and she works in my office. And we appreciate all the work she and all the rest of my staff have done putting this together. So I want to thank everyone for taking time to join us this evening at the Penny Workshop. This is our third financial education workshop uh, for, for women, and uh, I'm actually very proud to be putting it on for you. We wanted to do something special for Montana's women because um, if you don't know this already, which I'm sure you do, women think, spend, and save money much differently than men do. My apologies to a couple of men in the room. <laughs> Not that it's a bad thing, it's just different, right? All right. Um, so. Our first conference we put on last January, and we did this in Missoula, and it was a full day conference instead of just an evening event, and we had over 200 women who attended that conference, and it was such a great success, and that we really, we got a lot of great feedback, and folks, we started getting phone calls, and folks were asking us, can you put one on in Bozeman? Can you do one in Billings? So now we're doing multiple events, and you are getting what we hope is the best of the best from that Missoula conference, um, based on all the feedback that we got from those women. But before we go any further, I really want to just um, do a quick uh, few thank yous. First of all, obviously, thank you again for coming tonight. Um, I often, as you do, find myself incredibly busy running from one thing to another, whether it's taking care of the family, dealing with uh, work issues, uh, sometimes you know it's hard to balance all those and sometimes we forget to take care of ourselves and so thank you for coming tonight and focusing on yourself for a few hours um, also I'd like to thank our sponsors again and our host um, without whom this workshop obviously would not be possible first of all the Bozeman Public Library thank you Beth the Investor Protection Trust Fund um, who sponsored our appetizers and our meals this, e this evening. Uh, the IP IPT has been around since 1993, and it's a nonprofit organization which is dedicated to actually um, educating folks about financial, financial issues, including investor education. Uh, we all also want to thank the Women's Foundation. Uh, special thanks to Jan Newell and Kelsey Mahoney. And then also thank you to all of our speakers and organizations who are here today um, volunteering their time and obviously their expertise with us. And I want to say thank you again to my staff for all their great work in making this happen. I certainly couldn't do it without them. Uh, we called this workshop Penny because building your wealth happens very slowly, one penny at a time. And uh, as I can tell you that from my experience, just quickly, um, when I was, when I was uh, younger and was, and was first married, I never even really thought about the fact that I knew that saving was important, you know, because I had a piggy bank when I was a kid, like most do. Uh, when I got my first job, I opened up a checking account, which unfortunately I abused as soon as I graduated from high school and then had to shut it down and uh, learned a good lesson there. And then after I got married, I, I didn't think much about it because my husband had such a good job and he had a good retirement and you know insurance and all those things. I figured, you know, I'm taking care of. Well, obviously, you know, as you get a little older, you figure out that, gee, that not that's not necessarily going to be the case. I got to be able to take care of myself in case I'm on my own. And what happens if he dies first and then I am on my own? And maybe that's not enough. So that was, a, that was a good lesson I learned, but it really didn't hit home until I was really in my 40s. And that's when I really started saving for my own retirement. 
on my own. So I was a late starter. And then I started a business as well, and this was actually when I was in my 30s, and this was with my brothers and a couple of uh, friends. We started, I don't know if anybody remembers Montana Communications Network, MCN. There's one hand, maybe yeah. two, three, four. It was one of the very first internet service providers in Montana. And uh, I think Bozeman was the second place we came. <laughs> I remember that. Um, anyway, the first year in the business, we literally couldn't pay ourselves, because you can't when you start a business. Uh, not enough money to go around for that. But you do pay your employees. But by the second year, towards the end of it, we were able to start paying ourselves something. But interestingly enough, when we started deciding how much to pay ourselves, especially the top three of us, I did a really dumb thing because I'm a female. Uh, and I was married and my husband had a decent job. I said, well, my brother and my partner should make more than me. <laughs> because they're men and they have families to raise. Well, that was silly. I mean, I was working just as hard, if not harder. I was wearing multiple hats and I devalued myself and I devalued my work as a result. And frankly, I cheated myself out of my future retirement social security check too because I lost income, um, which you'll hear more about later, later on this evening, how that works. And finally, I, I just one other thing that I learned a good lesson about, and that was buying a good insurance policy that's not taking your money. <laughs> um, thankfully, I had a great staff person who set me straight on what I should really be doing with my life insurance policy and got out of that and got into a decent one. So anyway, that's my brief kind of mistakes I've learned in my life. I'm sure there were many others, but you know, it's really important that we as women talk about these issues and learn from one another, and that's why we're here. Um, when it comes to talking about finances, the studies really show that only one in three women feel that they are on track when it comes to planning and saving for retirement. And studies also find that women do feel confident in their knowledge of the day-to-day -day finances, you know, because we're all, we all usually take care of a lot of things when it comes to managing our homes. But they admit challenges in trying to meet their long-term financial goals, which is what we're really focused on here today. Each month, women put a higher proportion of their paycheck away to save for retirement, and are often, as I said, smarter investors than men but many have smaller retirement accounts. And why do you think that is? 77 cents on the dollar. You got it, 70 cents on the dollar. The pay gap, that's absolutely why. So very important to understand and very important that we work on fixing that. So this information obviously is a bit troubling when you recognize that women are much more likely to live longer than men. And today we're gonna to address those challenges head on. And so we're gonna talk about number one, investing 101, avoiding investment fraud, and making retirement decisions. And hopefully along the way you'll hear some great personal stories and you'll get some help in learning more about what you can do to save for retirement. So let's get started. Our first speaker today is uh, going to talk about Investing 101 and she's gonna teach you the basics. Uh, Laura Parvey Connors. Uh, is our presenter. Laura is uh, the communications director in my office, and this woman is a powerhouse. Her background um, with several startup business has taught her the value of being a Jill of all trades and maintaining a long-term vision while working within the current reality. She's a graduate of the University of Montana. Don't hold that against her. <laughs> <laughs> and Laura has a degree in print journalism with a minority in media arts. She lives next to a creek in Elkhorn Mountains with her husband, two sons, and a dog. Please welcome Laura Parvey Connors. Thank you, Monica. And thank you all for coming and being here today as a part of this workshop. When we first um, started thinking about doing this, gosh, it was probably over a year and a half ago, um, we really wanted to bring women together to talk about what Monica mentioned, how we think, spend, and invest differently. As women, we face unique challenges when it comes to our money and saving for our future. Let me see if I can get this uh, to move forward. Um, we live longer. We are, this is kind of depressing, we are likely to die single, even though we may be married at some point in our life doing, because we will, 
maybe experience a divorce or become a widow. We make less per hour than men, and we spend less time in the workforce. So here it kind of shows, this is, there's a lot of statistics out there, and you can, you can look at a lot of different places to find information. So one of the statistics I found is on average, women live 5% longer than men. This is saying that we'll live to be 81, where a man may live to be 76. This over here is a picture of my grandmother. My grandmother turns 97 years old in three weeks. I was able to go back to North Dakota and visit her last year. Um, she just recently, in the last couple years, moved into a nursing home. She was on her own until I think she was about 82. Um, and when I walked into that nursing home, she was in a really small town in North Dakota. I noticed there were a lot of adorable grandmothers in that nursing home. There were not very many men. Um, my grandmother has been a widow for 34 years. My grandfather died in his 60s. Um, and he set her up pretty well financially. They owned a farm and she was able to get some income from that farm throughout the years. So she has not been a financial burden on her family. And when I look at that, I think that's what I want for my kids. I don't want my kids to have to worry about finances in my future and taking care of me. <coughs> The bookend of that is my father is 64 years old, and I have been a power of attorney for my father for five years. He's, um, he can't pay his own bills. Um, we recently moved him from North Dakota to Utah so my sister could help with his health care, and he lives off Social Security. Luckily, he has enough in Social Security to cover his, his bases. Um, so I get, kind of get to see both bookends of that when I'm thinking about my own future and my own retirement. And while I got some good genes from my grandma, and I hope that I will live to be in my 90s, I want to be able to live the retirement that I want. And so I think about those obstacles that women have that I'm less likely to make as much money as my male counterparts. So I'll probably make 79 cents on the dollar. Also, I've been very blessed. I have an almost eight-year-old and a five-year-old, and since my eight-year-old was born, I've worked a flexible work schedule. I've averaged working about 32 to 35 hours a week, which allows me some life work balance, but I know that I'm working less hours. I'm not working those full, full 40 hours, so I'm getting less income from that. One statistic I found is um, right now, women who are over the age of 65 typically make or get 24% in social, 24% less in social security benefits than they than men do. So I know working less, making less, I'm not going to get as much out. We as women need to make our money work harder and longer to meet our financial goals. Goals. So one interesting thing too that I've found is that women actually do better when they invest their money, but they're not very confident to do so. They're, like Monica said, they want it, they can handle the daily the day stuff, but they're more comfortable going and asking a, doc, a doctor questions than they are going to a financial advisor and asking questions. So we have this confidence gap in women. Men tend to be a little bit overconfident, and they tend to take more risks, but they also move their money around. When they look at accounts, Men have made like 45% more trades than women do. <coughs> women want to do their research, they want to figure out what to invest in, and they kind of stay the course, which can sometimes work for your benefit. So why do you need a financial plan? There's lots of reasons. It could be if you want to buy a house, you're raising children, you want to pay for college, you're looking at your future. You want to retire the way that you want to live at the end of the day. So let's look at this. I'm going to ask you guys a question. Who is going to have more at the age of 65? We've got Anne. Anne invests $100 a month starting at age 25 for 10 years, and she gets 10% compounded monthly back. Sally invests $100 a month at age 35 for 30 years at 10% compounded monthly. 
so I clicked too fast. <laughs> <laughs> I gave you guys all the answers. <laughs> Did anybody know that before I gave you the answer? Yes. <laughs> so this is the this is the uh, power of starting young and starting to invest. And I know that's really hard. I know when I when I was in my twenties and looking at you know I didn't I was at, at my debt acquisition phase is like what I like to call them. Like, okay, I've got student loans. I'm looking at buying a house. I, I have a car payment. How am I going to spend money to invest? Um, my first job out of college was actually working for a credit union, which was very nice because I had people there to kind of help me and guide me and figure out what to do. And I had, we had one person there who was like, you really should open a Roth IRA. I was 22 years old. I didn't have much to put in it, but I opened a Roth when I was 22 and slowly just added to that. And I've added to that throughout the years, which I feel has benefited me because I worked for a lot of startups in my 20s too that didn't offer retirement accounts. And so luckily I had somebody there to kind of guide me and say, hey, this is something that you need to do. And I didn't just um, rely on my um, employer. So one of the things that I talk about with my husband with, he's like, oh, or there's a lot of people at my office that will talk about, they're talking about the markets and the markets are up and the markets are down. And it can be kind of scary. You're like, really, am I gonna, am I gonna make any money in this process? I'm like, they're up, they're down. So one of the things that I've learned is to focus on the long game. Um, this is actually a run that I did this weekend. I'm a runner. I ran four miles. And I think about all these peaks and valleys and heights and everything, and it's going up and down. And I'm like, I was looking at this graph, and I'm like, God, this kind of reminds me of the stock market. <laughs> like, am I ever gaining? And as I'm doing that run, I'm looking at the hill, and I'm like, OK, just one more step, just one more step. And as I get down that hill, I'm like, oh, yeah, this is nice. And then I turn around, and I'm like, oh, I got to go back up that hill. Um, but at the end, I'm like, my starting point was the same. It was out and back, but I gained 213 feet throughout the entire run. So I was kind of thinking, like, okay. Another story that I read today was focusing on hills, not strings. And so imagine for a moment that you're walking up a hill. But as you're walking up the hill, you have a yo-yo. And you're, you're really focused on that yo-yo. And the yo-yo is going up, and it's going down, and it's going up, and it's going down. And while it's going down, it's always that bottom point is always the same, but as you're continuing to gain elevation, you're going up the hill. So even when that yo-yo is at its lowest point, you gain over the long term. So one thing I would just say, and I'll say this to my husband when I get home too, is don't panic. <laughs> Investing is, much about psych is as much about psychology as numbers. So selling on, don't just sell out of fear or not get into the game because you're afraid. So how can we make your money work for you? And why do you want to make your money work for you? Well, I know, I like to work, but I don't want to work for the rest of my life. And I have dreams. I, I want to travel when I get older, and I want to be able to travel to the places I want to go. And I know that I'm not probably just going to stumble into financial security. I, I don't expect much uh, inheritance, um, although some people may be lucky enough to do that. So I, I want to plan. So when you're starting to look at putting money away, how much should you put away? I found something that was the 10, 15, 20 rule. So saving 10% of your gross income for retirement is the minimum, they say. 15% is the sweet spot, and 20% is a home run. Now when you're looking at the end of the day, 20% of your gross income, saving that might look pretty scary. Um, so I think gradually doing it, you know, if you can start at 10% and then gradually move your way up there. Um, I always like to look at things too, like when I get my car paid off, or when I don't have, um, Child care. My, my youngest is turning, he just turned five. He's going to go to kindergarten this year. Yay! That's like getting a raise, not having to pay child care anymore. So, trying to, I'm used to not having that. So, trying to take that money and put it somewhere that's going to benefit me in the long term would be beneficial. 
So where should you put your money? We have some great handouts over here um, that will talk in more detail about where you should put your money. Um, and we also have a retirement panel at the end of tonight that you can ask specific questions to that, that, that people are a CPA, a lawyer, and a financial <coughs> educator that can answer some of these questions. But two of the basics are there are different types of investments. There are debt investments and equity investments. So debt investments are where your money earns money. Someone pays you, pays you to use your money for a period of time and then you get money back as interest. So examples of debt investments are a savings account, a CD, a money market account, or a bond. There's also equity investments. This is where you buy something with your money that could increase in value. You become an owner of something you hope increases in value, and when you need the money, you sell it. So these are stocks, mutual funds, real estate, and businesses. So we actually have like this handout. This is the, the basics of investing for stocks, which is over here. And then there's also another one about how to maximize your retirement savings that goes into details of what different accounts that you could use or invest in. Like now I've moved everything around. Hold on. So what programs are available for retirement savings? And I'm just going to go very, very general overview here um, to talk about these. So we have traditional IRAs, Roth IRAs, a 403B and a 401K. Does anybody here know what a 403B is? A couple of you guys. So there's a couple state employees or people that work at the university system, maybe? Okay, so general overview of IRAs. So IRA stands for Individual Retirement Accounts. There's two different types of IRAs. There's a traditional IRA and a Roth IRA. Um, my kind of way I remember things, for a traditional IRA, your contribution is tax deductible on both your state and federal tax returns for the year that you make a contribution. So you may get a tax benefit for contributing to your traditional IRA. Withdrawals from that account are taxed. So that's kind of the basic rule of thumb. And then there's lots of different variables within that when you're looking at these different accounts. Um, Roth IRAs, on the other hand, provide no tax break for contributions, but earning and withdrawals are generally tax-free. Very, very basic overview. People will get into more details later on on that. Um, on employer-sponsored plan, this is where your 401k and your 403b come in. Um, your, your contribution limits maximums are pretty similar across the board on those, with your max contribution being 18,000 if you're under the age of 50 and 24,000 over the age of 50. Um, your 401k might be portable, meaning you can move it. Um, to another spot. Um, I think the 403B is portable, that's correct. Um, and so there's a matching schedule and a vesting schedule with the 401k. You may have immediate vesting with the 403B. So this is just a very, very general overview. Um, when you're looking at investing, it's always important to manage your risk. And so some ways that you can manage your risk is how can we do that? Is by consulting a professional. <laughs> um, having those discussions, one of the things I always try to keep in mind is diversification. It's having your money in many different places. Um, so one example, let's say you have you have a portfolio of only airline stocks. If it's publicly announced that airline pilots are going on strike and that all flights are canceled share prices of the airlines will probably drop. And so your portfolio may also drop as well. However, if you counterbalance balance your airline industry stocks with a couple of railway stocks, only part of your portfolio would be affected. In fact, there's a good chance that the railway stock prices might climb as passengers turn to trains to travel since they can't be on the airlines. 
So one thing I always think about is just having money in different places and having them in different risk levels throughout that. You want to invest regularly in good times and bad. Um, one thing I always heard is, why are we always so afraid to invest when the stocks are down? We'll buy shoes on sale. Why aren't we buying stocks on sale? Um, one advice is to pick funds managed by experienced professionals. So checking with the people who you're investing with before you invest, and you can do that by calling our office and making sure if the, the sales agent is licensed or the security is licensed with us. So what's next? The secret to getting ahead is getting started, right? So what do we need to do? You might want to consider talking to an advisor. This handout here talks all about what you should look for when you're looking at an advisor or trying to figure out if you should do things on your own. You'll always want to make a, I like to make lists, consider what your retirement goals are and how you can work towards them. You'll want to consider where to invest. You may want to talk to your investment advisor about that if you have one. Um, diversify, as I talked about. You'll want to think about the tax implications. Maybe you'll want to talk to an accountant about that um, to figure out what's the best options for you. And consider the costs. You always want to consider the fees of something that you're looking at investing in and making sure you're not going to that's going to dwindle your account down. Yeah. Are you doing anything about having it be um, automatically you're signed up for your 401k and you have to sign a paper to not be in it so that young people are more likely to do that? I mean, they've looked at making the, the best choice the easy choice. So is our state looking at doing that? Um, I'm not sure who would be in. Yeah, that would be something that the, you know, the U.S. Department of Labor would have to look into. Yeah. They oversee any type of ERISA plan, and the 401k would be an ERISA plan. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Sorry, I don't know how unique this question is, but um, I had the unfortunate experience in the last month of inheriting some money from my grandmother, who was 100 when she passed, by the way. And I have no idea what to do with it. Um, I'm a woman of modest means. I have a small pension. I worked for the State Department for 25 years overseas, teaching English as a second language. But I am one of those women who didn't really plan for a rainy day. I mean, a rainy day came for me because I worked hard my entire life. So I do have a couple of pennies coming in. And at 51, I'm still working. Um, <clears throat> once we settle the estate, not that I'm going to be a gazillionaire, but I honestly have no idea. I've, it's more money than I ever really kind of imagined. Go Nan. But, because um, she was of that age and that history where people put money away for a rainy day and apparently the rainy day is her 51-year-old granddaughter's future. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm writing down Roth IRA and, you know, I've had 401k contributions over the years, but honestly, any suggestions? Um, Apart from me getting a plane ticket and traveling the world and going to the Peace Corps. Um, which that is, is sounds amazing too. <laughs> I own a home already, by the way, um, and I, I don't have a mortgage. So I do have that investment. Any other ideas? Um, I, would, I would recommend you maybe find an investment advisor to sit down and look at where you're at and how much money specifically you're looking at. What your long-term game is too, personally of how long you would want to invest and put your money away. Um, and you may want to talk to several, up to three different investment advisors to get some some advice on that. And, to, and to check out the investment yeah, advisor? Yeah, and check with our office about them. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you want to make sure that that investment advisor, that financial advisor, number one, is licensed to do business in the state of Montana. Number two, that they haven't had any complaints against them, um, because that does happen. 99% uh, of all of our financial advisors in Montana do a great job for their customers, um, and but we you can always it's always important to do your homework, and, and we're a resource for that. Um, Marsha, I have one question. Yeah, Laura, I was wondering yes. if you have uh, set up a system where you save <coughs> automatically, and how do you do that, and how does it work for you? 
Um, I, I do have a system. I actually have like where my, my Roth, I have it auto automatically just taken out of my account um, on a bi-weekly basis, I think, um, right now. Um, we are in the process of renovating our home and we are paying for all of that out of our own pocket as well. So that's cut into my savings program a little bit over the last couple of years. Um, but yeah, I do. I, I, and I also have um, uh, CDs set up for my children already um, that are actually tied to financial education. So it's, it's, a, um, it's a CD that offers them, like they get a certain percentage back, they can get up to 10% back on the <coughs> CD as long as they fulfill this financial education requirement by the time they're 18. Um, so there's there's systems I've kind of put in place to help with that. Is that your financial thing CD with them? Is that the deal you've made, or have you found it was a place to credit union? Offered through the credit union. Yes. Okay. Great. Yeah. So I try to be proactive in some of that, looking looking at where I can get a good return. Is uh, are, are most of the financial advisors fiduciaries in the state? And do why is that important? <laughs> you smile. I'm, I'm smiling at Lynn because I'm going to let Lynn answer this question. Lynn Egan's our security <laughs> yes. deputy in the, in the office. <laughs> there are two. There are two types of investment professionals. There are salespeople that will sell you a product for a commission. And they have a duty to make a suitable recommendation to you. They don't have to put your best interest first. Then there's the investment advisor rep who manages your money for an asset under management fee. Half a percent, one percent, one and a half percent. They have a fiduciary duty and they have to put you first. And by just charging an asset under management fee, they always want to grow your portfolio because the more your portfolio is worth, the more of a fee you'll pay. So always ask when you go, and sometimes a commission only is the way to go because with the asset under management situation, you're paying a fee whether or not there are trades, but the only one at the current time that puts you first is the, finance, is the investment advisor. Are folks like Edward Jones representatives, Charles Schwab representatives, are they um, investment advisors or the ones that are responsible to you? <laughs> I'll just come just up here. Come up. <laughs> Edward Jones advisors generally have both types of licensure. They will only have one or the other relationship with you. So when you go to Edward Jones, if that's where you're doing your business, ask your rep, do I have an advisory relationship or do I have a salesperson relationship? Generally the break-even point is about $100,000 in assets under management because you're going to be paying a fee whether you're doing business. Uh, with Charles Schwab, it's likely you're doing a retail commission-based business um, and they're giving you suitable recommendations, not always, but generally putting your best interest first. They don't, aren't required by law to put your best interest first, but I would hope the 110,000 salespeople licensed in Montana try to put us first. Doesn't mean they have to, but I hope that they are doing so. How much money do you need to have before you can justify paying someone to help manage your portfolio. I know you said 100,000 a minute ago. We have about 70 state domiciled investment advisor firms. We have 800 federal <coughs> registered investment advisor firms. And I would say the average minimum that they will set up an account is $100,000. That's because if you pay 1%, you're gonna pay $1,000 a year in an annualized fee. And if you're not doing anything, if they're not doing it, if they're looking at your portfolio quarterly, um, that can be a sizable amount con considering. But 50000 is not unheard of. Um, the fee generally goes down the higher your account is. Um, but if you're not doing a lot of business, you can certainly buy a mutual fund that's managed by an investment advisor and you're not paying the direct fee, you're paying it indirectly through the fees you pay for the fund. Okay. One last question before we move on. No, I, I'm sorry. Would you repeat what you said about Edward Jones and the way their advice or their people operate? Most of the Edward Jones representatives have both types of licensure. They can do either type of business. 
they're not going to be in a situation to sell you a product, charge you a commission, and then charge an asset under management fee on top of that. That would be double dipping. So you generally enter into a relationship in one capacity or the other, but you can get all full service broker dealer firms offer all of the services, and your reps generally can do either type. They're not going to do both with you. So depending on what your long-term goals are, how much money you have to invest, there's a choice that you can make. And Edward Jones will, and, and I, all the firms really will offer that for you. All right, I know it can be complicated on this. I want to say thank you to Laura for her presentation. Please join me. And thank you to Lynn for asking us the questions. Um, after this next presentation, um, we will be taking a break. So if you do have other questions, certainly um, come and talk to Lynn one on one, one, -on -one or one of us. Um, and then we'll probably send you to Lynn. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Most questions we can answer, but when you start getting into some of the more technical security stuff or um, investing stuff, Lynn is really good.